Hello everyone. Thank you so much for coming out and for tuning into our live stream today. We're gathered here to grieve and process in response to the horrific shootings on March 16th. My name is Crystal Jin Kim and I'm one of your MCs for tonight's international vigil. I am a second generation Korean American filmmaker and artist born and raised in Georgia and I live less than a mile away from where the second shootings happened in the city. The church I grew up attending is down the road from where the first shootings occurred. I was asked to open tonight by sharing personally as an Asian American woman. I wondered if I should speak about growing up, watching my parents work so hard that the calluses on their hands split and bled again and again. I wondered if I should speak about the countless incidents of disrespect disguised as jokes, the explicitly cruel words, the unwanted touches from strangers, peers, at times even from instructors and medical staff towards me, my family members, and friends over the years. I wondered if I should try to explain how I felt upon hearing the news last Tuesday. I wondered how I could possibly articulate our sorrow and rage, our hun. I share these vignettes instead to say simply that my heart aches with yours. We are here to mourn the lives taken and to speak out against hate incidents over the past year and in our long and widely unknown history. I'm thankful to be with you all on this day of action and healing, and I pray for all of our safety, for greater change, and respect for the inherent value of human lives. And now I'd like to introduce my co-MC and dear friend, Alexis jung Ha, a fellow board member of the Metro Atlanta chapter of the Korean American Coalition. Hello. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us tonight, whether in person or virtually. I'm a 1.5 generation Korean American, and I work as an attorney. While I was not born in the US, I moved to, the, to Georgia when I was three, and I've been here since. This is my home. As Georgia is the home of over 490,000 Asian and Asian Americans, 100,000 indigenous people, 3.4 million black people, and 1 million individuals part of the Latinx community. And it was the home of eight individuals before their lives were cut short this March 16th. We do not know much about these individuals, their hopes, their dreams, their struggles, their lives. But we affirm and declare for them and for ourselves that our worth is not tied to our work, title, accolades, how long we have been here in the US, or how well we speak English. We are here today to remember the eight people we lost this March 16th, and to mourn them as people with inherent value. That said, during our vigil, we will not be saying the names of these eight individuals, as we would like to respect the wishes of some family members who have requested for people not to share 
the names of their loved ones. We thank you for your understanding as we start our program with a minute-long moment of silence to be followed by prayers by local faith leaders. Our first prayer is led by Imam Abdullah Jaber, the Executive Director of CARE Georgia, the Council on American Islamic Relations. The one who takes an innocent life, it is as if he has taken the life of every living human being. That's what the Quran says is an estimation of the value of one single human life. I implore you to join me in prayer. Dear God, we know that there's nothing in this material world, in this material universe that can equate the value of a beautiful, flourishing life that you have created. Dear God, we don't have the words to describe the sorrow that we feel as we stand and we mourn with the families and the loved ones of these brothers and sisters that we have lost. We're here to mourn. We're here to stand with the families. We're here to honor the lights that have been extinguished much too early, but we don't have the words, and at times we don't have the strength. We ask you for strength, and we don't have enough power to wipe away the tears from the families. We ask you to console their hearts. We don't have the words to say to the children left behind we ask you to give them strength and inspire them every single day. We don't have the ability to stand in front of them. We ask you to be with them at every moment. We're here to mourn. We're here to stand with the families, dear God, but we also know that we can't honor them, we can't stand in front of their families if we don't reveal the very reason why this has taken place. How do we stand in front of their families if we let hatred and division and rhetoric divide us as a nation? We can't honor them if we don't see that there are forces who sympathize with the very system that may be very responsible for the lives that we have lost. We ask you to enable us to reveal so that we may heal. Enable us that we, we are able to address the symptoms of a greater sickness and illness within this nation. It is not enough for us to take down statues across the nation, across the state, and ignore the statutes that still uphold injustice within our nation. We have to challenge the very voices, very laws 
that may be very well responsible for the lives that we have lost. We ask you to enable us to rise again. We ask you to enable us to follow the words of Jesus when he said that all of the commandments of God are summed up in the single command. You must love others as yourself. Not love for others what you love for yourself. No. Enable us to love others as yourself. And the messenger, Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and all of the messengers says, you cannot earn the pleasure of God until you love. And you will not love until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. And the Rabbi Hillel, when he was approached by a person who said, could you teach me the Torah in the time that I can stand on one foot? And Rabbi said, what is hateful to yourself, do not do to your fellow man. That is the whole Torah, and the rest is just commentary. Enable us to embody your love, your mercy, your guidance, as we go through these days and these moments. And again, we're here to mourn, but we're here to also address the reasons and systems and reveal so that we may heal as we move forward. Dear God, we're here to mourn, to stand with the families, to honor the lights that have been extinguished. We are not able without your blessings, without your love, without your mercy. We ask you for acceptance. We ask you for guidance. We ask you to give calm to the hearts of the loved ones. Amen. Maya Sunim from Chandungsa Buddhist Temple will lead us in prayer next. Sabah, 
Tai, a board member of Four Points Church of Atlanta, will lead us in the last prayer. Let us pray. God, we seek your comfort for the families and friends grieving the loss of their loved ones. We commend to your mercy those at the margins who bear society's greatest injustices. Take our pain, our fears, our anger, and our grief into your infinite justice and mercy. Fill us with peace. Bring us together as one people, one community, and restore our hope. We pray, Christ Lord, with Langston Hughes, gather up in the arms of your pity, gather up in the arms of your love those who expect no love from above. You are the God of all comfort, solace, and peace. Across our city, our nation, and our world, we lament with you. Today, in the last weeks of the Lenten season, the holiest days of the Christian calendar, let us rest in your embrace. For the unbearable toil of our world, we plead for remission. For the pain of absence from our beloved, we plead for your comfort. For the scandalous presence of death in your creation, we plead for the redemption of all things. In the name of Christ, amen. Thank you, Mike. Next, we will have a poetry reading by Jesse Leanne.
Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Um, this poem that I'm about to read is based off of tiny details that I found about the victims, things that they loved. I hope that it honors them as much as it honors us and our collective experiences, our collective grief, and our collective yearning to be seen, be heard, and belong. Their hands, they softened sores, tamed tensions, untied knots. They knocked on aches, pointed them outside, and said, get up, pack your bags, and go. Their hands, they made space for us to breathe easy, flipped on the lights in these foreign rooms, clasped the edges of the kitchen counter like a prayer, like maybe the stove could be an altar for my offerings, maybe even a sanctuary for my belonging. Their hands, they patted dry the tofu, massaged these leafy immigrant greens, scooped up families of rice into a boiling new country, never thought once about how brave it all was, only that it was necessary. They stirred the kimchi stew with a wooden spoon, then tucked it away into a little white bowl like a parcel of home, an envelope stuffed with the feeling of full, postmarked to everyone like it would never run dry. Their hands made space for us to be full and take space. And their hands, they'd sometimes clutch the karaoke mic like a sword, sliced their songs into the dark and glittering room, sang shout their dreams, simple dreams, <laughs> like one day I will travel for leisure instead of survival, and I will live long enough to see my grandchildren live the life that I paved for them the life that I could never live. Their hands, they rocked their children in an envious slumber, held their tiny fingers, whispered terrified promises of, I will take care of you. Their hands took care of us. Held close everything worth holding. Let us lay their worn and traveled hands on top of their holy hearts to rest, that they may finally hold, hold themselves and be held. Let us stack our hands on top of theirs, a planet of embrace, one collective push, one breath of world back into their lungs. Give them back the voice for what they could never say. Give us the voice for what they could never say. Make space for us to make loud. Yes, make loud, the sing, shout, dreaming, make loud, the ripping open of parcels of home, make loud, the huffing and puffing before the breathing easy, make loud, the soothing and the screaming, make loud, the whimpering and the warring, make loud, the peacekeeping and the power keeping, make 
loud, the standing and the dancing, the holding and releasing, the quiet and the mouth wide open like ocean laughter make loud, the whistling of freedom make loud. Turn on the lights, sit at the table, weep, then hold hands, hold hands, and feast. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Next, Adelaide Tai, visual artist and singer, will be sharing a song. I'm just a traveler, but I've traveled far. I know what it's like to get lost in the dark, waiting for morning or moonlight, a friend or a fire. And I'm not a drinker, but I've lived in bars. I know what it's like to forget who you are. Living inside of a memory can make you feel tired. Your 
mistaken So where do you reach when you can't find the mask Can't find the medicine for the pain in your chest Pick up the phone if I'm sleeping in Rome I will answer We don't have to talk, you don't have to explain I won't say that everything's fine But heartache feels better with your hand in mine I won't say that everything's fine Thank you. Now we will hear from some community representatives. First, we have Sarah Park, president of the Metro Atlanta chapter of the Korean American Coalition. ASEAN, 태평양 계를 향한 차별과 폭력은 이민자가 미국의 첫 발을 내딛었을 때부터 존재해 왔습니다. 우리 모두는 소수를 위한 경제적, 정치적, 사회적 시스템을 지탱하기 위해 사용되어 온 인종 차별이라는 도구 아래 묵묵히 저항해 왔습니다. 함께 때론 홀로 아파하며 누구보다 열심히 일했고 사회를 위해 헌신했습니다. 당연한 권리를 요구할 때 우리의 목소리는 외로웠으며 그 근거와 타당성을 반복해서 뒷받침해야 했으며 다음 세대에게 물려주고 싶지 않은 벽 앞에 긴 순서와 시간을 기다려야만 했습니다. 그 사이 우리 지역 사회의 구성원이자 나의 가족인 고령자, 여성, 노동자 등의 사회적 취약계층은 인종 증오 범죄에 우리 대신 무방비로 노출되었고 우리는 지난주 한번 또다시 하나님의 형상으로 지음받은 고귀한 생명을 누군가의 가족을 잃었습니다. 우리가 지켜드리지 못했습니다. 이제는 우리 모두가 피해자의 고통을 내 고통으로 인식하고 함께 목소리를 내야 합니다. 피해자와 우리의 지역사회가 아파올 때 우리는 앞장서 우리의 일상과 서로의 다름을 내려놓고 외치고 연대하며 나아가야 할 것입니다. 아시안 태평양계를 향한 차별, 폭력, 증오의 문제는 미국과 세계의 문제가 될 것이며 우린 그때까지 멈추지 않을 것입니다. 우리는 증오의 역사를 종교, 인종, 세대, 정치색을 넘어 연대의 힘으로 공감과 이해를 통한 인식 제고로 나의 이웃을 향한 사랑으로 변화시킨과 동시에 그 증오의 역사를 끊어낼 것입니다. Since the first Asian immigrant crossed the Pacific Ocean and arrived in America, 
there has been discrimination and hatred towards our communities. Even as we work to improve our economic, social, political standing, we were always limited by unfair and imbalanced system. We learned that being academically and economically successful is not enough. When we try to speak up against this unfairness, our lonely voices were often ignored and drowned out. We cannot let this injustice carry on for future generations and our community members. We must do the hard work for them. In the midst of trying to overcome these barriers, we allowed our most vulnerable populations, such as seniors, children, women, working class, to become victims of the census violence. Our voices failed those when they needed us the most. In our voice, we must make clear that we want all of our families to be treated with the dignity and love they deserve. When these families cry out, we must set aside our differences and we must answer their calls and step forward. Racism and hatred is an American and global problem. In order for us to overcome these great challenges together, we must truly love our neighbor as we love ourselves. It is only through love that we can truly change hearts and minds of those are around us. Thank you to the Korean American Association of Great Atlanta, KC National, KA Boat, Nail Foundation, and all our tireless community leaders and members. Also, thank you to all of you who have tuned in tonight's vigil for he healing. God bless you all, and thank you for all that you do. Let's go home to our workplace, speak, and increase our dialogue, and speak louder. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Next, we have a mental health professional, So Young Yun, who is a licensed professional counselor with over 10 years of experience and focuses on trauma counseling. Thank you so much for the introduction and for having me here today. I am just so incredibly honored and grateful to be here to share this space with you. When I was first asked to speak at this vigil, I was immediately panicked. I said, thank you, but no thank you. But not because I didn't see the significance or the importance, but it was quite the opposite. I didn't believe that anything I had to say would be enough and that I would be enough. Like so many of us, we have grown accustomed to being silenced and being undermined that even during a time when I should speak out, need to speak out, I wanted to choose to hide and suffer in silence instead. But that reflex of silence is not new to many of us. Asian Americans have been conditioned into silence to avoid drawing attention to ourselves at all costs because if we cannot fit in, we might as well be invisible. But Asians are proud people, and many times we feel this sense of pride over the number of barriers, challenges, and obstacles that we've been able to overcome despite the insurmountable odds. And unfortunately, with that comes a misguided assumption that suffering equals strength. So we don't cry out for help, we don't talk about our pain, we don't ever talk about our failures. And the more you suffer, the stronger you are. But unfortunately, that only perpetuates a culture that diminishes us and it invalidates us and continues to traumatize us. So over time, we become so used to certain realities like discrimination, objectification, dehumanization, sexism, racism, and the list goes on and on. And we normalize it and have just accepted it, that the world is just this way and there's nothing you can do about it. That is just our reality. But we didn't come to feel and think and behave this way overnight. It comes from generations of being made small and dismissed. It is deeply ingrained in 
and embedded into our culture, our skin, and even in our DNA. We experience and share these traumatic experiences, and the impact of that is so powerful and long-lasting. So our collective trauma is caused by our ancestors who live through wars and through oppressed um, times in their life. It comes from parents who uproot their entire lives, give up their own dreams, and buy into the American one, the American dream, so that they can provide a better life for their families, only to be treated as if they're expendable and exploitable. It comes from previous president and administration spreading anti-Asian rhetoric, creating hostile violence and abusive environments for AAPI communities, leaving some of our most vulnerable members to be injured and beaten. It also comes from a white man who targets three Asian businesses and viciously murders eight people eight of whom were Asian women, women like myself, my mother, my sisters, my cousins, my friends. And then they refused to call it what it is, a hate crime. So while most of us have no personal connection to the victims, it hits us on a very personal, intimate, and even visceral level. And the emotional, psychological wounds leave permanent scars for many of us and for generations to come. But unlike physical injuries, very few of us are willing to seek professional help and even ask for help. Studies show that approximately 8% of Asian Americans seek mental health services compared to 18% of the general population. So mental, mental health is still very much stigmatized in our communities and some Asian languages simply don't even have the words or vocabulary to identify the disorders and the related issues. But the reality is that the longer we stay silent, the longer we ignore our pains, the deeper our collective trauma will run and prolonging the much needed healing that we all need. Seeking mental health support is not just about healing our own individual wounds, but it's also about healing the interrelated interconnected wounds of our family and friends, our community, our generation, the generation that came before us and the ones to come. Which is why I encourage you to challenge the stigma surrounding mental health and consider what it would be like to truly heal yourselves and others and our entire community from the inside out. Breaking the cycle of collective traumatization. And even if you're not ready to speak to a professional, Allow yourself to reach out to your family and friends and open up and share your feelings and experiences honestly. And I embolden, embolden you to come out of your cloak of invisibility. Find your voice and tell your story. Because your story is our story. And it deserves to be heard and it needs to be heard. Thank you. Thank you, Soyo. Next, we have the Georgia State Representative for House District 101, Sam Park. Good evening. My name is Sam Park, chair of the Gwinnett delegation, and the only Korean American elected official in the Georgia State Legislature. It is my honor to be here with you this evening to share in your grief, in your pain, and in your anger. My heart breaks at the senseless loss of life from this mass shooting. This morning, I attended the funerals of two of the victims, the families and loved ones of the victims. Their lives have been shattered by this horrific act of violence. The children of the victims whom, I'm, whom I had the opportunity to meet with were in tears, but grateful for the love and kindness demonstrated by each of you and by people across our nation and the world. I ask each of you 
to continue to pray for the victims' families and loved ones, that they may receive the comfort they need. And I ask that each of you do whatever you can to continue to support them, to help lessen this heavy burden. After a year of escalating violence and discrimination against our Asian American brothers and sisters, I know that there is a lot of fear in our community. The most common refrain I have heard from family, friends, and community members is, am I next? I want to encourage each of you, do not be afraid. This is our home. This is our country. And we will stand and fight to protect our community, the vulnerable among us, and the next generation. We must unequivocally condemn the racist political rhetoric that put a target on the backs of our children, parents, and members of, our, of the Asian American community and unleashed the latent xenophobia and hatred against Asian Americans in this country. Our community, we have held elected officials, including the former president, accountable for the language that he used, and we must continue to do so. Dangers we face today. However, rather than react with fear, to persevere and overcome, we must act with wisdom and strength. We must understand the long history of Asian Americans in this country and our place in it. From the Chinese Exclusion Act, to Japanese internment camps, to, raci to racially discriminatory immigration quotas that were not repealed until 1965, we must understand that racism, discrimination, and violence against Asian Americans is not new. That even if we were born in this country, that people will see us as Asians first, not Americans. Yet despite these challenges, I have hope because those who came before us persevered and thrived, providing each of us an opportunity to pursue our American dream. And I know we shall do the same in honor of our forebears, in honor of the victims, and for the benefit of future generations. We must also understand that the troubles we face are not isolated just to Asian Americans. Now is a time for us to stand in solidarity with the black community that has suffered 400 years of systemic racism and oppression. Now is a time to stand with our Muslim and Jewish brothers and sisters, with immigrants and refugees, with the LGBTQ community, with all who face discrimination and violence because of who they are, because of the color of their skin or whom they may love. As Dr. King says, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. When we come together as Americans, there is nothing we cannot accomplish. We can and we will build a country where each of us may be free to live without fear for our safety, where every child, regardless of the color of their skin, has an opportunity to live and pursue their American dream. We can and we will bring about the beloved community, a community of justice, of equal opportunity, and love. I want to remind each of you of the power you have to bring about the change that we need to protect our communities and build a better world for all of us. Our communities, black, brown, Asian, and white, with the power of our vote, we help change the course of our state and our country. There is nothing we cannot do if we stand in solidarity with one another and support one another. May we put our differences aside with the understanding that we truly have more in common and that we are indeed stronger together. So do not despair or give in to fear. Let us honor the victims of this horrendous act with both our words and our deeds. Now is the time to stand our ground, to speak out and ensure our voice is heard. Let us organize, build solidarity with our communities of color and use all the power that we possess 
to bring about a new America that lives up to its founding values to ensure each and every one of us have the freedom to live in peace and safety, that each and every one of us may live with equal dignity in our homes and in our communities, and a nation that ensures justice for all our communities and brothers and sisters. Thank you. Thank you so much, Representative. Now I'd like to introduce Inse Ufot, the Chief Executive Officer of the New Georgia Project. Good evening. So yes, uh, my name is Inse Ufot and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the New Georgia Project. Um, and <clears throat> it is a privilege to be here in community with you all this evening. Um, so Brene Brown says that when you get to a place where you understand that love and belonging, your worthiness is a birthright and not something that you have to earn, anything is possible. I believe with all of my heart and all of my being that each of us is worthy and entitled to love and belonging. And last week, our community was violated in the most violent way. <clears throat> and as we gather here to mourn, I imagine that for those of us who are asking questions, why and how and am I next? Um, that it's difficult to imagine that we can move beyond this. How do we atone? How, who atones? Who's responsible? Who protects our community? <clears throat> when I um, immigrated to this country with my family, um, you know, as a precocious child um, who had very African parents, um, all I wanted to do was hide. Uh, being an Atlanta public school student who brought fish and rice to school every day when I really just wanted to bring peanut butter and jelly sandwiches like my colleagues, like my classmates. Um, my difference, I thought, was you know what made me a target um, and that I thought that in order to really be an American um, in order to sort of live up to the ideals uh, that you know that it, we find often in the rhetoric of what it means to be American that I had to shrink that I had to erase uh, who I was and <clears throat> as I've gotten older um, and as I have sort of settled into the community um, and made this place my home, um, I understand that this country is better uh, because of my difference, because of our differences. Um, and that is why it is a beacon of hope uh, for many across the globe um, I love this country, I love this state, but as any child of an immigrant knows, um, when you love something so much, you should not be afraid to tell the truth and you should not be afraid to be critical. And so it breaks my heart that we live in a state where a madman, or I don't know his mental health, so let me retract that statement but a man was able to buy a gun and murder eight people on the same day, but we can't register to vote and vote in the same day. I think that because I love this state, because I love this country, I'm able, it's our duty to say that what had, that there are and individual actions that violated us and violated our community. 
but there are also conditions that have been created that our leaders and their racist rhetoric have created the conditions and, and given permission for people to be violent uh, to one another, to be violent to us. And so I say to you today that um, in the words also of another American writer, Zora Neale Hurston, that if we are silent about our pain, they will kill you and say that you enjoyed it. And so I want to thank you all for holding this vigil tonight. Um, I want to thank you for saying enough, no more. I want to thank you for not being silent about your pain, about our collective pain. Um, I want to thank you for creating space and creating community for people to mourn so that we can heal, so that we can continue to build the Georgia and the country that each of us deserves. Thank you. Thank you so much, Inse. Next, we will hear from Martha Ravello, a member of the Latinx community and the outreach director of the office of U.S. Senator Raphael Warnock. Thank you so much for uh, allowing me to be here tonight. It's an honor and um, I just wanna thank everyone for coming out today to take a stand and to help in healing our community. My name is Martha Ravello and I'm here not only on behalf of Senator Raphael Warnock, but as a Latina. Growing up here in Atlanta for me, from immigrant parents uh, and seeing everything that happened last week, it really hit hard. And I just want to let everyone know that our community is here to stand with you against all forms of hate and violence that has been targeted to our AAPI community, not here, not only here, but nationwide. The tragic violence visited upon our AAPI community is on top of mind for all of us. And on behalf of the Latinx, the Latinx community, we send our deepest condolences to the families of the loved ones who are lost and everyone who is hurting as a result of this heinous crime. Um, I just also want to, on behalf of the Senator, I just wanna let everyone know that he is taking steps to address the rise of the anti-Asian hate crimes we've seen this past year and to stop this mass gun violence. And I want you to know that we are following this investigation very closely. In closing, I just wanna lift up the victims and their families and offer my sincerest sympathy on the tragic loss of their loved ones. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here and I just want everyone to know that our team and our community stands with you. And I just want to end in a few, a few words in Spanish. Somos un pueblo y estamos juntos con ustedes. We are a community and we stand right next to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martha. I'd like to introduce Julie Katz, the Assistant Director of the American Jewish Committee. Good evening and thank you for having me today. My name is Julie Katz and I am the Assistant Director of American Jewish Committee's Atlanta office. American Jewish Committee is a global Jewish advocacy organization that works to advocate for the well-being of Jews and all minorities around the world. Because we understand that as minorities, we cannot be free from oppression until all minorities are free from oppression. This is especially relevant today because tomorrow marks the start of the Jewish holiday of Passover, which commemorates the liberation of the Israelites from Egyptian slavery. This message of liberation takes many forms. 
Liberation means freedom from hate and fear. Liberation is having the ability to live in peace, prosperity, and acceptance. We lost eight beloved souls in last week's tragedy who were deprived of these rights. And when anti-Asian rhetoric and hate crimes began to rise last year, the entire Asian community was deprived of these freedoms and rights. This is unacceptable. We call upon our leaders and community to say no to hate and to take action to ensure the safety of the Asian community. We call upon our leaders to show that hatred has no place in our society. Even though we are here tonight with a call to action, the hatred isn't going to go away. There's hard work to be done to eliminate the bias and violence from our society. The Jewish holy book, the Torah, tells the story of a Roman matron advising Jewish leaders to hold a loud demonstration in Rome against an anti-Jewish decree. A student once asked what the Jewish leaders could have conceivably thought to accomplish against the mighty Roman Empire. His teacher answered that even if they accomplished nothing, they had to let out a shriek of pain so that nobody thought they were not bothered by the injustice. Their cries represented the repudiation of indifference. They served as a reminder that suffering has to be acknowledged, that wrongdoing cannot be accepted. And at the very least, our presence here tonight says loud and clear, we stand against xenophobia, we stand against terror, we stand against violence, and we stand against hate. We will continue to speak out against anti-Asian hate. The Asian community deserves to feel safe and live free from harm. And the Jewish community will be right by your side advocating with you until this happens. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. Next, Jungwook Lee, the KAC National Vice Chair, will be reading a joint statement from four Korean American members of Congress. Representatives Andy Kim, Young Kim, Michelle Park Steele, and Marilyn Strickland. I have the honor of speaking, uh, reading the statement, joint statement from the Korean American members of the Congress. Their statement is as follows. Tonight's vigil is not just a reminder of those we've lost. We've also come together as Korean American members of Congress to demonstrate our solidarity in the face of hate and fear. No one action, level of government, or individuals can stop Asian hate. But by coming together and bringing allies with us, we can make progress that will keep our AAPI community safe and honor those lives so cruelly and prematurely to have taken from us. To the families of the eight victims, you have our deepest condolences. We can and must always remember their names and work addressed to escalating violence against Asians that cost them their lives. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, we have Kim Yun Chul the president of the Korean American Association of Greater Atlanta, who will be reading a statement from the Republic of Korea through South Korean Ambassador Yi Soo Hyuk. Hamorshimnugil,还有,阿特兰特,阿特兰特,阿特兰特,阿特兰特,阿特兰特,阿特兰特,阿特兰特,阿特兰特,阿特兰特,阿特兰特,阿特兰特,阿特兰特,阿特
아시안계를 겨냥한 혐오 범죄를 강력히 규탄하며 이에 맞서 다양성, 존중, 융화의 가치를 지켜내고자 하는 모든 노력을 지지합니다. 대사관은 앞으로도 미국 관계기관 및 치안당국과 긴밀히 협력하여 각종 혐의 범죄로부터 우리 국민들을 보호하기 위한 노력을 지속해 나갈 것입니다. 감사합니다. Now Grace Choi, the former co-chair of Korean Americans for Biden and the former AAPI director for Stacey Abrams will be reading a statement from the White House through Congressman Cedric Richmond, senior advisor to the president and director of the White House Office of Public Engagement. My heart goes out to all who are joining the Asian American community to remember the victims of the horrific shootings in Atlanta that claimed the lives of eight people. I know this is a very painful time for everyone in the community who are mourning this tremendous loss, including the Korean American community, as four of the victims were of Korean descent who immigrated to the United States in search of a better life and for the API women's community, as six of the victims were Asian women. President Biden has made clear that he condemns the distrusting rise in anti-Asian violence and that hate can have no safe harbor in America. Our prayers are with the families of the victims and everyone gathered today to grieve and to try to find solace together. We will stand together against hate against racism, against sexism, against violence, including gender-based violence, and stand up for justice, for love, for healing. Thank you so much. At this time, I'd like to ask our guests to please stand and light your candles. Again, out of respect for the families of some of the victims, we will not be reading their names out loud. Instead, a bell will ring for each of the eight victims. This ends our scheduled programming. We welcome you to take some additional time to process and grieve. Thank you again so much for attending in person and via our live stream. Have a great night.